All right. So you burn coal, and then that forms ash, and the ash works its way through this whole system, and then we add mercury, and that gets mixed in with the ash, and then we add lime slurry, and then that gets mixed with the ash, and then we go to the baghouse, and that catches the ash and gets it out of the system so that you don't see anything coming out the stack. And you know, we regularly run a 2% opacity. So how does the bag house do it? By letting it collect on the outside, so all start fluffing the bags. That is that is a hundred percent true. So you got a, a giant duct that has dirty air in it, dirty flue gas, coming from the SDAs, going that way into the board, and then coming off of it, you've got inlet dampers going to the individual compartments, Then you've got a tube sheet that runs across the top. And you've got 1,600 bags and cages that hang down. So the bag has a surface area, and then the ash forms on the outside of the bag and only the clean gas comes through. And then that goes into the clean duct, which is going to the ID fans and out the stack. And as the stuff builds up on, builds up on the outside of the bags, then we've got So you've got three compressors, and you're only running two of them, and they're maintaining it. Well, they go to a receiver. I'm going to have to back my picture up more and more. Oh, there's stuff out there that I don't have memorized. There's like a pre-receiver and an after-receiver, and those things. All right. So that goes into a receiver, and then that goes to an air dryer. There's freaking screens in there too. So there's I'm going to end up ditching this whole video and have to do some research and come back and remake it. Coalescent. 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 filter. That's my problem. Coalescent filter. Coalescent filter. All right. Coalescent filter. So the coalescent filter is not really trying to catch particles so much as it is trying to give water a surface area to fall out on. Uh, the lube oil conditioning skid is also a co coalescing filter. So, and then this has a little solenoid and goes to a drain. And you're saying that we bypassed the before fil the pre filters? Yes, sir. And then we go to the dryers, and then we still go to the after filters? Yes, sir.
And then we go to the air receiver. And then we're maintaining 120 PSI on that air receiver. And so that air receiver is kind of like a water tower or a bladder or what else is like that? A capacitor. It's some way of storing some of this energy so you have some volume to give up in the case of something going wrong. And if you just came straight off the compressor header, then if something went wrong with compressors, you would have no time to react before you had problems. So the biggest load on the compressors out back is cleaning. Is it 50? 45. 44. 42. 45. 44. All right. So I think if it's wide open, it's 50. I think 50 is as high as that thing's supposed to be able to go. Though there's a bypass around it, so we manually can do whatever the hell we want to. Um, and the, the idea is that the higher this pressure is, the better it knocks the ash off but also the more it damages the bags. So we want to have this pressure as low as we can get it and still do the job of knocking the ash off the bags. And then there's 40 rows per compartment. There's 20 rows to each half of a compartment, which I know sounds stupid, but we're used to looking at them half, a half at a time. And uh, then each one has a solenoid that lights off. And uh, the way we do our cleaning, all 14, there's two controllers, one for the north and one for the south. So seven compartments at once all get that pulse poof, on the same row. Like if it's doing fifth row, it's going to do the fifth row on all seven compartments. And you're going to see that pressure on the gauges drop down to 20 and then come back up. And there's inside those controllers, there's little knobs that nobody's touched in eight years or so that let you control how long the pulse lasts and how long it is between pulses. If you get these pulses too short, you won't make it up back up to your 44 any, anymore. And then this valve is wide open doing all it's can and giving you all the air freaking can and it's still just not enough to recover for how fast you're pulsing. Uh, similarly, if you pulse it longer, then it goes down lower and you run into the same problem. The valve can't fill it back up before you want to pulse again. And I legitimately think those haven't been touched in, in yeah, eight years or so. But there was a time at first during commissioning when they were getting tweaked, it seemed like every week, because not because somebody wouldn't be happy with what somebody else did. And then if you're not cleaning enough, you get high DP. So the differential pressure across your entire bag house, normally at full load runs somewhere between eight and nine inches. Uh, as it gets dirty, it comes and it will climb up to 10, and I think, I think 11 is the alarm. And then it gives you another alarm every damn inch, like, hey, you're still fucking up. So if you're not cleaning well enough, then this DP goes up. And if you, so if the pressure's not high enough, if you stop cleaning all together because compressor trips and it was bad. In addition to pulsing the header, those compressors also run all these valves. So if, you have, if that pressure gets less than 40 pounds, there's a whole bunch of valves that start doing the wrong fucking thing. And all of our pretty controls start going out of fucking whack. Not all of them. SO2 and opacity, both, both start struggling really bad. So uh, another problem with high DP across it is that there is a limit. So there's a pressure transmitter on the inlet VID fan. And if that guy gets to a minus 36 inches, it trips both ID fans and trips the planes. And the idea is that this ductwork is only so strong 
And uh, if you're minus 36 inches, they're worried about getting crushed like a soda can. So there's something built into logic. So when it gets to like a minus 32, it goes, nah, I'm not going to give you any more than that. Well, what that means is it stops doing its job over here. And this minus 1 becomes a minus 0.5, becomes a 0, becomes a plus 0.5. And then you guys out there fucking notice. Yeah. Somebody walking the boiler will notice a plus one inch. And you ruin your water cannons. Uh, that usually doesn't happen at a, a plus one inch because they have seal air going on. But yeah, they have been they have been burned up. All right. Quit cleaning at four and start again at five. It quits cleaning at something low and it starts again uh, a couple inches higher. And I don't know what those numbers are. And uh, at full load, you won't see them. At full load, it is constantly cleaning. Uh, there's 14 compartments, and I said it was pulsing them all at once. There is another mode where you only clean one compartment at a time. Uh, so this means that it will shut the inlet and outlet of that one compartment and just pulse that one compartment. Now, if you think about it, if you're cleaning online, which is what we normally do, you're pulsing the, to knock the ash off the bags, and at the same time, you're pulling dirty air through the bags and pulling it right back on. So it kind of works its way down the bag a several steps before it actually falls into the hopper. And if you did offline cleaning, the bags would get way cleaner. You'd go through, you'd pulse each header, everything would fall off in the bottom, and there'd be nothing sucking it back on. The problem is it's not 14 times cleaner, so it can't keep up. You get one compartment cleaner, and all the other, the other 13 are getting dirtier faster than you can keep up. So we have abandoned that plan. And then somebody said, hey, why is the logic written like that? Why can't we pulse all 14 but still isolate one and pulse it too? And it was like, yeah, that's a great idea. Never happened. I have no idea what happened to that one. Uh, I, I think what happened was that uh, Jack made the, uh, the uh, plant manager angry and stopped getting his way. So there is one big inlet gate for the entire compartment. There are three outlet poppets, which are big round cylinders that go up and down. And then there is a bypass poppet. So when you isolate the compartment, it is the inlet and the outlet that go shut. And this bypass never moves. And this bypass collects the dirty, connects the dirty path directly to the clean path, and that's the path of least resistance, and none of the ash is going through the bags at all, and it's all just going straight to the ID fan and straight out the stack. Why, when would we ever do that? When we were burning uh, fuel? When we were burning fuel oil during startup. So the soot, the, the oily soot that you get from uh, uh, oil burn is different than the dry ash you get. And it will build up on these bags, and then they, you'll get high DPs because they just won't let as much stuff through anymore. You'll ruin your bags. So until we get our first mill on, so for the first 10 hours, 12 hours or so of a startup, then the uh, bag house is bypassed, and then everybody's looking out their windows, everybody on the sill is looking at the plant and going, man, I can't believe it lives that dirty thing. But, you know, if we run 100 days, and it takes... 10 hours of black soot coming out the, the top. This is not that bad. This is not that good. Yeah. And uh, we brought in various uh, burner experts and stuff. And the burner experts that have seen a startup were like, hey man, we can do way better than, than that on your capacity. We can, we can get things way, way cleaner. And they were like, that's not what you're here for. We're only going to start up like 
like a five percent of the like 0.5% of the time. We need to run efficiently the other 99.5% of the time before we worry about freaking startup. Which is valid. It's, it's, a, it's a valid way of thinking about things. Uh, there are things in the logic that make this bypass come open that I think have all been defeated. There was a, a low temperature on the inlet that would make it come open because you didn't have permission to run it because they were worried about they're worried about sludging up the bag, just basically not working at all anymore. You have a big, big pile of clay where you're supposed to have a bag house. Um, but we had some transmitter issues that made that go wrong when it shouldn't have, and you know, and then, then we violate our opacity limit. Hey, what's our opacity limit? Zero. Zero, no, zero is not a limit. Two percent is what we run all the time, so it better not be zero. Guess again. Do I hear five percent? <laughs> what? Five percent. No, five percent is also wrong. You fell for it. Ten. How about ten? Is ten the limit? Ten seems wrong. Is, is fifteen the limit? Is twenty the limit? All right, so it's complicated. It's a ten percent is the real limit. This is a six minute average. So remember before I was talking about SO2 has a three hour average and CO has a 24 hour average and mercury has a 24 hour average and then there's like 30 day averages. Six minute average. You don't have long to fix this. Oh, but the first one doesn't count. If you get one six minute average bad in an hour, that's okay, as long as it's under 20%. That's your real limit. If you're over 20, you're fucked, no matter what. If you're less than 20, but more than 10, and you only do it once an hour, you're okay. But like I said, we normally run 2%. Uh, it comes into alarm at 6, and uh, it doesn't. the alarm doesn't clear until you get below, like, 4. So it's when we start running 5, and then you get these little spikes that go up to 7, and then the alarm doesn't clear for a long time, and then people are like, hey, we gotta do something about this, and then we start changing out backhouse apartments. Uh, we've been a lot more aggressive about that lately, where it got up to four, and they're like, hey, we know where this is going, let's go ahead and, and start taking off lids. And I think Kevin wanted to make it so every weekend, just do a damn apartment, all the time, all year. And uh, there's been a little bit of pushback from the supervisors, like, I don't think we really need to. I think that we're going to open a lot of lids and do a lot of work and fuck up more than we fix. Let's wait till it gets worse. This ash falls off the bag, and then what do we do with it? Nuva feed it. We Nuva feed it. Nuva feeder is actually Nuva is actually a brand. So we just feed it. <laughs> so we've got a blower, and it runs along like that. And then it's got a separate header that blows on top. And then the other thing it's got is an equalization line. So the top gate and the equalization line come open, and that lets the ash fall in, and it lets the air get pushed out and go back up here because this is under vacuum. And if you didn't have this equalization line, and if the equalization valve locks up, then that bottom gate's going to open and it's, it's going to be slow filling with ash. It'll still fall because gravity still works. But you've got suction pulling up and you've got no good way for the air to get around the ash and it just doesn't fill right. Inside the Nuva feeder, there is a probe. And the probe is supposed to let it fill until you see the probe and then go hey, that's good, and then it stops filling, and then it blows and 
it stops filling, so it shuts the top gate and it shuts the equalization line. And then it opens the pressurization line and opens the bottom gate to push the, the ash out. And then when that probe clears and stays clear for 15 seconds, then it goes, hey, I, now I know I've gotten rid of the ash. I know I'm really moving the ash. I saw it fill, I saw it go away, everything's good. And then it goes on to the next step and starts filling again. The problem is, one probe will fuck up an entire side. So if this probe decides that it's never going to clear, then this baghouse compartment, this Nuba feeder, is never going to fill. It's going to sit there and blow the entire time. You're not going to be able to empty the others as often. And this one thing is going to keep blowing all of it. Or similarly, if it thinks it's full all the time, if the probe fails and, and says that it's always full, then it's just going to sit there and always be lined up to fill that, and it's never going to blow the stuff out. That doesn't fuck up your whole line. That only fucks up the one. So we gave up on this early on. Maintenance was not able to keep up with the issue, so we said, screw it, and put them on timer. So you've got a north header and a south header, and then you also have another one that goes to those three rotor air heater hoppers that I drew out on the other side. I'm not going to flip the board over, just point at them and come back to it. Uh, when these things are moving ash, we said that the ash was coming in here at like 160 degrees. So these will get nice and toasty warm on the outside. And part of your rounds is to just come and shoot the thermal gun, and there's a sticker that tells you exactly where to shoot it, so you know you're getting the same reading every time. And you know not only that you're getting the same reading, but that the guys on the other shift are getting the same reading. And that gives you some idea of whether it's doing right. It's something you can write down that's more precise than, yeah, warm. This equalization line, there's really nothing to see. You just hear a click on it. All the others have pistons you can see move, and you can go, okay, I have a good feeling that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. You can add oil to these lines. They're all coming off. They're all coming off the same air receiver. And there's one manual valve that goes to a solenoid block. that is doing all four of those guys. If I was smart, I would have crossed my lines. So you can shut this valve, you can disconnect hoses, you can put oil in the lines, you can do all that on your own. Uh, there is also vibrators. We don't run the vibrators. Why don't we run the vibrators? They fall off. Because they fall off. They shake themselves until they break loose from their mountings and fall. Uh, you will go and you will look and you will see that the vibrators have, there's like a D-ring welded in above it and there's like a cable that connects the vibrator to it. But we just, instead of working them until they fall off, we don't really need them. They root that you don't really need them most of the time. Sometimes if the flue gas inlet gets too cold and you start getting clay back there, then it does help to have the vibrators on. So if you have a high level that won't go away and you don't know why and everything looks right, hit the vibrators. Uh, the solenoids, I think, are still clicking every single time whenever it's in fill mode. Uh, if you go up on the catwalk, there is an oiler, and I think that's where they're isolated. Each each one has got the air shut off to the vibrators. I think the only, the only one to be able to have, like, out and Bravo, that's just because it makes it look faster. So Alpha and Bravo are in the front, so they catch more ash than the others. Um, After we do a bag change out, there's a 50% chance that somebody messed up and one of the bags ends up not on there good enough and ends up falling down and ended up into the top gate and then ends up with 
There's a big manual gate here too. And maybe you can shut that manual gate and work on this top gate, but maybe when you try and shut this manual gate, you're pinching off on top of the bag you're trying to get out of the way and you can't do anything with it. Maybe you can pull the whole thing out the window, shut this air valve so these things aren't cycling when you don't want them to. Maybe this bottom gate doesn't hold that well, so when you try that and open the window, you got ash blowing fucking up, up out at you. That, so that, that's an example of something we used to be able to do. And maybe you can, maybe you can't. Depends on the new feeder, you don't know. Um, and then you can maybe grab a hold of it, and maybe get a chain fall, and maybe pull the whole thing out through the window, or maybe it caught, gets caught up on the bottom gate, and then you have to lock out the blowers, and then you have to take the bottom gate apart. And these are all things that we've gone through. And, I, and let me tell you, I don't know why, but the maintenance guys can take that bottom gate apart twice as fast as anybody else I've ever seen. Any, any operators we send out, and, and maybe, you know, it's just having done it, the, being the guys that get stuck doing it, they're the guys that know how to do it. But then they'll say, oh, that's not our job, we're just helping you. <laughs> I don't know why so many things that break are their problem, but when it's a bag that falls into it, that's an operations problem, but they'll help us out. But that's, that's the way they phrase it nearly every time. They want to tell me, you know, we're just helping you out. I'm like, okay, well, thank you for helping me out. Because it doesn't matter to me whether they think they're helping me out or whether they think they're doing their own job if we get to the same endpoint. I'm not going to argue about whose job it is if someone's helping me or whether they're doing it on their own. I'm going to be thankful that I'm getting help or thankful that they're doing it on their own. <coughs> Anything else on new feeders? All right.